How do you do, everybody? We are naturally very pleased that we've won the cup, and we hope everyone thinks that we've thoroughly deserved it. I need hardly say how pleased I am we've won the cup this afternoon, and very proud of the fact that the Arsenal's been successful in bringing the cup south once again. I'm very happy to win the cup, and every man in Newcastle has done his duty. That's all I need. It must be marvellous to walk down those steps, holding the FA Cup. All those cameramen waiting, all those fans cheering. Then there's the lap of honour, all that chaos and all that lovely noise. And where it's noisiest is where the real fans are. Something always tells the winners to pause for a moment and give those fans a special salute with the cup. Billy Bremner knows what it's like. So let's follow him around. And it all started here in 1923. The first Wembley final wasn't all ticket, and a quarter of a million fans turned up. The place was designed to hold fewer than half of them. More than 200,000 forced their way in, spilling onto the playing area. The first Wembley hero was that policeman on the white horse who helped clear the pitch before Bolton beat West Ham 2-0. Northern teams were to dominate Wembley finals during the 20s, except in 27 when Cardiff beat Arsenal. The London club soon returned to Wembley. Huddersfield in the striped shirts had been the super side of the 20s, winning the league championship three times running and finishing second on the fourth year. But after they lost their famous manager Herbert Chapman to Arsenal, it was the Gunners who became the major power in the land. British movie tone, new to filming football, didn't capture the first goal scored by James for Arsenal. But they did get some terrific counter-attacks from Huddersfield, pressing for an equaliser. During the game, an unexpected visitor. It was the Graf Zeppelin, Germany's giant airship. Arsenal manager Herbert Chapman sees his team go two up, ten minutes from the end through Lambert. Parker collects the cup, and Arsenal have become the first London club to win a Wembley final. In those days, the lap of honour was rather more sedate.
Standing here, with 11 men between you and a goal as you kick off, the chances of scoring within a few seconds seem impossible. But it happened. In 1931, West Bromwich Albion in striped shirts met Birmingham City. Albion soon forced an early lead after a goal mouth scramble. Richardson was the scorer, and even in those days there was action replay. In the second half, Birmingham drew level with a goal from centre-forward Bradford. Here it is again in slow motion. But within less than 30 seconds, they're losing again. Direct from the centre spot, Albion sweep downfield. Richardson, the man who kicked off, completes the movement, beating Hibbs from close range. Birmingham couldn't recover from this, and Albion had achieved the first half of a great double. They went on in the same season to clinch promotion from the second division. In those days, players didn't kiss and hug goal scorers. But when your team has just won the cup, you still couldn't escape the fans. Takes a brave man to kiss him. In a tight situation, it isn't easy to decide whether a ball has gone out of play. Sometimes the referee is left behind, the linesman's view is blocked at that vital split second, and then the controversy starts. Controversy was never fiercer than after the 1932 final. Newcastle met the favourites Arsenal, and the London side scored first when Hume centred and John got the decisive touch. Newcastle fought back to get the most controversial Wembley goal of all time. Collecting a pass, Richardson for Newcastle races to the byline. We stop the action as he is about to cross. No sign of the referee. And where's the linesman? Ah, here he is. But the ball is on its way into the back of the net from Allen. And the man with the flag isn't even level with the penalty area. Let's see it again from another angle. Arsenal fought back but were understandably demoralised by the referee's decision. In the second half, Allen scores his second. It's the winner for Newcastle. Until this time, Movie Tone hadn't provided a full commentary for their cinema coverage, but the style soon changed. It was the year Dixie Dean and Matt Busby played at Wembley. of cheering the two teams file out with their shirts numbered for the first time in the cup final. Everton White 1 to 11, Manchester Dark 12 to 22. Now the Royal Standard signalizes the arrival of the Duke of York who is representing His Majesty. The Everton players are the first to be introduced to His Royal Highness by Dixie Dean their captain and famous goal scoring centre forward. 
The Duke of York, who is accompanied by Sir Charles Clegg, President of the Football Association, then meets the Manchester City team, presented by Sam Cowan, their skipper. Cowan and Dean toss up under the eye of the referee, Mr E. Wood of Sheffield. And is it an omen that the Everton captain wins with the coin? And so matches the kick off against the Sun and into a slight win. Tozlan, the city's right winger, is soon in the picture, but is robbed by Cresswell, Everton's left back, probably the best man on the field today. Then Stein, Everton's number 11, an outside left, has his first shot at goal, which Langford, the city's keeper, gathers and clears. The two captains fall out. Cowan, number 18, is acting as policeman to the dangerous Dixie, number 9. And the Everton centre forward doesn't get a chance in these early stages. When he does, he misses it. Oh, Mr. Dean, what an open goal to dream about for the rest of your life. But within two minutes, the mistake is repaired. Stein has an easy shot when Langford, the city goalkeeper, pushes the ball out to his feet. And the congratulations come fast and furious. The Duchess of York is taking a keen interest in the game. Beyond her is seated Lord Derby, that great Lancashire sportsman. After half-time, Everton, with their goal lead, continue to press despite all the wiles of James McMullen. Number 13, the city's brilliant inside left. Watch this throw in by Britain, the Everton right half. His wonderful kick presents Dixie Dean with a chance in the goal mouth, but she doesn't miss this time. Congratulations to Dixie. That was a great goal, and it's worth seeing it over again. Britain to Dean. Dean, ball, goalkeeper, all into net in slow motion. One of the game's fighters on the city side is the outside left, Brook. But no goals came to him this cup tie. Geldart, Everton's speedy right winger, is another hero of the conflict, giving Langford a lot of trouble with his accurate shots, centres and corner kicks. From one of the latter, Jimmy Dunn gets Everton's third goal and a little right inside from Glasgow puts the issue finally beyond doubt. The cup is Everton's, but there is some delay in claiming it. However, Dean marshals his teammates at last, and there takes place the happy presentation by the Duchess. Head of the second division, 1931, first league champions, 1932, cup winners, 1933, what a record! Well played, Everton! Tom Webster, a newspaper cartoonist, was engaged by Movie Tone for the Cup Final Commentaries in 1934 and 35. In those days, if you weren't able to go to Wembley, the only chance you had to see the match was on your cinema screens. As most fans take their football pretty seriously, I wonder what they thought of these comments. This is Tom Webster at Wembley, almost talking. Bossmen in white shirts are coming out now. Manchester City are really astonished why Portsmouth ever came out. This is Manchester City, or part of it. Look at that Manchester goalkeeper picking up his feet. He thinks he's in the Grand National. This is a bird's eye view of the play. They were the only birds who got in for nothing. Third, the Manchester City inside left is being carried off. Unfortunately for Portsmouth, he came back. Bossman are now going to score. Aren't I a good guesser? What a save. Look at that save. He'll be in the Salvation Army next year. Manchester City are now pressing. They're so pressing, they're almost urgent. The players have now left the field, which is the best thing that's happened to the field since the kickoff. Manchester City are losing, but this won't trouble a city like Manchester. Anybody who can stand there where they can stand anything.
Manchester City equalise. Cotton goes up half a point and a rainbow runs right through Manchester. The winning goal. Look at that Portsmouth player taking the ball out of the net. Hasn't his back got a sweet expression? Tom Webster was back again the following year. In order to give you a shock, this is Tom Webster talking. We have now got as far as Wembley, which incidentally is much further than Chelsea ever got. The place is of course packed. Count them carefully, there are 90,000 people present. There are only 90,000 people present because the other 650,000 couldn't get in. Sheffield Wednesday and West Bromwich Albion are of course the two finalists. And they are appearing in this match by kind permission of the Arsenal. The two teams are presented to the Prince of Wales. At this distance, West Bromwich Albion look very happy because up till now they haven't been presented to Sheffield Wednesday. The captains toss up. Albion in dark shirts, Wednesday in white. The Albion kick off. So they really started all the trouble for themselves. Here they go. Every man for himself and heaven help the directors. Inside three minutes, Palethorpe scores for the Wednesday. And this made Sheffield almost a nice place to live in. Now will all the Sheffield people in the audience turn their heads away? Because here is something very distressing. Boys equalises for the Albion. Well, after all, boys will be boys. There should be a better joke than that, but I can't think of it. now half time. The game up to the present is a draw. And as both teams have left the field, the ground is looking better than ever. Here they are, starting the nonsense all over again. Sheffield attack fiercely, but the Albion goalkeeper clears just in time. This is done in order to give everybody in the Midlands heart disease. Sheffield scored a second goal. Taken at a distance in order not to annoy anybody in West Bromwich. Albion equalised. At least the referee said so, but the Sheffield goalkeeper refuses to believe it. Here's a picture taken from the air. Photographed this way in order to avoid seeing the players' faces. The Wednesday score again, and everybody in Sheffield give each other a pocket knife. Sheffield scored another goal and I'm getting a bit tired of saying this. The Albion goalkeeper is very annoyed with the ball and he nearly scores another one for Sheffield. Then came the dawn, but nobody got up for it in West Bromwich. Imagine a cup final penalty in the last minute of extra time. There's no score and 100,000 pairs of eyes are looking at you. For the goalkeeper, the size of the target he has to protect suddenly seems enormous. For the penalty taker, that target shrinks with every step. This was the situation in 1938, when Preston North End met Huddersfield County. Stadium kicks off. Huddersfield in striped shirts. Preston North End, favourites despite the loss of Dougal and Milne, in white shirts. It's soon seen that Young, the Huddersfield captain and centre-half, is in form. While as for their attack, Young Isaac is prominent at inside right, dribbling upfield with Hume on the wing in watchful attendance. The Preston defenders, however, beat off the raids, and corner kicks by the ex-Arsenal winger Joe Hume are not driven home. So the tide of battle swings from end to end. And in the counter drive by Preston, O'Donnell, their outside left, misses a chance. Half time, no score. His Majesty no doubt recalls the match in 1922 when the same protagonists met in the final and he, as Duke of York, made his first cup presentation to Huddersfield. 
Preston start the second period, quite a feature of which is some mighty throwing in by Shankly, Preston's right half. Still a match of defence, the halves and backs of both sides dominating the game. Not for 18 years has extra time been needed in a cup final, but at the end of 90 minutes play, there's nothing to report. Both teams join in the post-mortem of missed opportunities while resting. Then there's another toss-up, which Smith wins, and the kick-off is again Huddersfield. There's a quarter of an hour more to play each way, but even now, neither side can gain the advantage. Preston kick off in the second half of extra time and excitement increases as the minutes pass. Many have abandoned hope of a goal and a replay begins to look like the only result when the last minute drama occurs. Much, the ball at his feet is going to shoot when Young tackles. Much falls and the penalty is given by Mr. Jewell. But before showing that, Movie Tone repeats the incident for you in stop motion. Well, that's precisely what happened, as the referee's decision was a penalty. Much takes it, the ball hits the bar and goes in. Wolves came to Wembley as the hottest favourites for years. But after 30 minutes, Barlow had scored for Portsmouth. And though this strong young Midlands side was fighting desperately to stay in the game, Portsmouth was soon to get a second goal. Anderson throws one down and beats Scott with a cross kick. And now watch his acrobatics in slow motion. Anderson has a shot, it bounces off a defender, it comes back to him and Scott just touches it as it whizzes into the net. With Parker on the right, still watching like a cat. Just look at that. Half time and the Wolves two down. Portsmouth kick off. Barlow sends it right over to Parker on the left wing. He races down and he centers for Barlow to score. Too easy. In slow motion, the ball comes to Scott from Barlow and Scott is a couple of yards out of goal. He half stops it, he spins round and he just can't retrieve it. It's over the line, but Parker takes no chance and he forces it into the net. There are going to be no disputed goals for him this afternoon. Then there's a dance. Pompey's plan seems to be working so well, they're back to the childhood gaze. And dancing a ring a ring a rosie. Half the ball is over, there's a rally by the Wolves. Burton, the right wing, has a shot. Walker saves and clears up field. But the pressure continues. Dorset, Rowe and Westcott all collide and crash. Another attack, and Walker looks to be heading for Kingdom Come. But at last, the Wolves get one through Dorset. When we give it in slow motion, we get the best out of it, for it's the Wolves' only goal. From then on, it was all Pompey. Worrell centers. It's clear. Then McAlinden is off. He taps it back to Worrell. Worrell sends it over to Parker. Parker centers to Barlow. Barlow back to Parker again. And Parker shoots. And he's tipped over the bar. Tipped down, sir. Pompey's just going to score again. And Parker does with his head. In slow motion, after a wing-to-wing -wing movement, Worrell sends one over to Parker. And Parker is in perfect position to do the rest. Scott touches it, but it's traveling too fast. Pompey could have gone on scoring all night like this, but the whistle goes for time, with the result Portsmouth 4, Wolves 1. And so Jimmy Guthrie collects the trophy from King George VI. This had been Pompey's third appearance at Wembley and their first victory. They were to remain holders for a record seven years without playing a match. Another competition called World War II caused the suspension of all official soccer in these islands. The first final after the war promised to be a classic. There was tremendous talent on both sides. The colourful sailor Brown for Charlton, and for Derby, two of the greatest of all time, Peter Doherty and Rach Carter. After Derby had followed through right from the kickoff, Charlton promptly made a counter-attack. Sailor Brown, number eight, was prominent now and throughout the match. Charlton pressed hard and Derby only kept them out at the expense of a corner.
already excitement was running high both off and on the field and there were a number of accidental infringements in the keen struggle for an early lead. Derby made some very dangerous raids with Carter number eight as the leader of their flying squad. And it was Carter who provided the first really big thrill when he netted. But he was offside. So it took the crowd some time to realize it. <laughs> Half time came with no score. But there was a display of vaulting and agility by members of the Army Physical Training Corps who seemed, if anything, almost more athletic than Charlton. The King chats with the president of the FA, the Earl of Athlone. The PT boys become more and more athletic while the crowd waits and watches. With the princess is Mr. Brookhurst, the FA chairman. The second half opened at a fast pace and the crowd were wondering whether Derby were going to make up for a number of chances missed in the first period. Or perhaps Charlton were going to bring out something extra good this half. There's Sailor Brown making one of his runs. Then the newcomer came on the field to join in this exciting game. He was just making up his mind which side to play for when he was ordered off. Still, he had played in a cup final, which is more than most dogs can say. It was still anybody's match, but Derby had proved the more dangerous in attack. Charlton supporters may have been pinning their hopes on an old gypsy curse which said Derby would never win a cup final. Of course, you can't always tell what a football crowd is thinking or saying, not even in close-up. Just the same, they were enjoying themselves, each in his own way, that's certain. Then came the number one score. A shot from Derby's left wing went in off Bert Turner. One not for Derby. Our slow motion camera recorded the goal. Bartram had just saved, but was out of position. Then the Duncan Doherty combine went into action again. Turner tried hard to keep the ball out, but, well, it was just one of those things. Excitement, I should say so, but no one guessed that within half a minute, Charlton were going to equalize. From a free kick, Bert Turner scored. He must have felt pretty good at that moment, having put things right, so to speak. One all, but Derby were now giving Sam Bartram a very hot time. With over 35 minutes of the second half gone, the Rams fairly battered at the Charlton goal. Bartram was almost continuously airborne. and still won all, so an extra half an hour has to be played. Welsh having again won the toss, Derby kick off. They attack and keep on attacking. Now they're well on top of a tiring Charlton. Within a minute or so from an opening made by Stamps, Dirty makes it 2-1. Another 10 minutes play and Derby all out for the kill. Jack Stamps, their centre forward, beats Bartram to make it 3-1. time in the extra time, Charlton kick off and though they battled gamely to retrieve the situation in the last period, they can't prevent Stamps doing it again. Charlton were back the following year, wearing white shirts and led out by skipper Don Welsh. Here he is with Burnley captain Alan Brown before the kickoff. It was mainly a defensive game, and we pick it up in the second half of extra time. Even the first half of extra time produced no goals, so off they went again. Talk about marathon soccer, this was it all right. Even now, there didn't seem to be any reason to suppose that either side could break through the opposing defence and score. 
Like his opposite number, Alan Brown, Harold Phipps, number five, Charlton centre-half, played a remarkably stout game. Bartram, by the way, had a lot of work to do in Charlton's goal, and he did it in absolutely first-class style. As we all know now, Chris Duffy, who worked so hard, he even played on the right wing as well as the left, proved to be the match-winning hero. With about five minutes to go, he scored with a first-timer. Having done so, he had quite a long run before he could find Jack Shreve to tell him all about it. Burnley fans were definitely not amused. But for the benefit of Charlton supporters, here's another view of how Duffy did it. In 1948, Stanley Matthews makes the first of three cup final appearances. It's Blackpool meeting Manchester United. Look at the old man go. Blackpool put on early pressure. They take the lead through a penalty when Mortensen is tripped, although it looked just outside the area. Not a bad dive. Shimwell takes the kick, which Crompton almost saves. Almost. Blackpool one up and going very strong. Rickett centres from the left wing and Mortensen makes a magnificent effort that just fails. Oh, hard luck indeed. The first half hour was hardly over when Manchester equalised, Rowley banging home a centre from Delaney. Five minutes later, however, Matthews is at it again, working his way through when he's tackled by Afton, Manchester's left back, who scrambles about on the ground and evidently hands it. The free kick that follows gives Mortensen his goal. It also gives Blackpool the lead again. The Duke of Edinburgh was with the King, watching this most thrilling of cup finals, and when Blackpool kicked off in the second half, thrills were mingled with anxiety, if you can judge by individuals in the vast crowd. Blackpool's left-back, Crossland, the comparative newcomer to big football, rose to the great occasion, but from now on, he and all the team were up against it. 25 minutes after the restart, Manchester drew level when Rowley finished off from a free kick. Two all, but Manchester now right on top. Within five minutes, they take the lead for the first time when Pearson runs through and scores on his own. Cheer up, sir. The match isn't over yet. All the same, it was as good as over when Manchester's right half, Anderson, scored from far out to make it 4-2. Never mind, my lad. Better luck next year. Join us for part two and more great matches. Joe Mercer teams up with a famous cricketer. The Wembley Injury Hoodoo. Some great goals. Tony Duffy gives away a vital penalty. Matthews gets his cup winner's medal. 
and a London club completes a fabulous double. All this and much more in part two of Wembley Soccer School, presented by the Daily Mirror.